can chat afterwards if you'd like, continue conversations. But right now, uh, they gave me a microphone, so I get to talk. So, so you guys got to just listen for a little bit. Uh, Anyway, thanks. Put a lot of power involved in it. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Ben Pierce. I'm uh, glad you're all here. Uh, I mentioned the first, the first church, and man, it's just it's awesome that we can all come together on a Sunday morning and, and, and worship with God in the all church. And we all have different backgrounds and different struggles. And this went on this week that we keep working through and that God's working through. But we can come into this room together from all those backgrounds and all those experiences. Some of them probably happened on the way to church this morning. So we can leave those behind and sit here and worship God and to learn more about Him and become closer to God together. And, and what a privilege it is to do that. So I'm glad you're here this morning to experience that with us here at Venture. And uh, as we go into His Word, I just want to pray that, that God will continue to uh, just, just bless us this morning as we look at His Word of God. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for, uh, God, your church, uh, the body that, that God, you have given us. God, you, you've given us the opportunity to be a part of the serving to uh, fellowship with. God, we thank you this morning for, uh, for music that you give us, to, just to be able to come into your presence and worship you. God, we thank you for your word. You preserved it for us so many years later that we can really know who you are, really know and experience you through your word. And so I pray that you would just, uh, your Holy Spirit would speak through these words as we do this morning. And God, that we would be blessed this morning. So we come closer to you through the rejoicing of your word. And so let's take some time together. All right, so um, we're going through a series called uh, Living Strange, the Live Strange, and we went through First Peter. And uh, if you look at your bulletin, there's a little line on it that says a few verses, like nine through something. You can take your first year note taken. The first thing you do is take a pen and just scratch that off. And, and, uh, and because it's interesting when you're studying the Word of God and, and God is teaching you. Um, when, I, when I study the Word of God, when I'm preparing to teach, I want you guys to know that I learn way more than I could ever say in 30 minutes up here. It's awesome what God teaches us. And he, and, he, and he carries me from one direction to the other. And so throughout the, the week, I was just really drawn to a different passage of Scripture for a few So sometimes God works after the bulletin is printed, and so we have to go with that. So, so um, you can scratch that off. Today we're going to be in uh, chapter 4, but verses 7 through 11 of First Peter. And uh, the title today is, The End of All Things is at Hand. Um, as we've gone through this this series, with Pastor Guy and Luke and I have kind of worked our way through through the book of First Peter. It's been a theme and kind of a this theme of living strange, and and there's a pattern in the way that Peter teaches us. And every every Sunday as I've listened and I, as I've prepared also to teach, there's this pattern that says, in light of this truth, because we believe that this thing is true, you should live your life accordingly, because you believe that it's true. He's not asking us to do things just because he said so. He said there's things, these truths that are existed in this world. There's things that God has done, God is, God is working on, that God has, has done in the past, that he's going to go do in the future. The way that God is working in your life, because these things are so true, that you can count on those things, you can take them to the bank, that you should live your life in this way. There's reasons behind that. All the way through First Peter, he says that. This, therefore, live your life this way. And this morning is no different. This morning, as we look at the passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, the first eight words, the end of all things is at hand. Semicolon, therefore. So as we read the next few verses that say, therefore, live your life in this way, we can't truly, I came this week to understand that we can't truly understand the, 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 how this passage continues and the verses that come afterwards unless we understand what this first eight Verses mean the end of all things is at hand because he's asking for a response to that truth. He's saying the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, do this, 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 and this. Live your life in this way. So this morning we're going to look at that. What that means. The end of all things is near. And this week, as I was uh, as I was preparing, uh, um, I commute a lot for my job, a couple hours a day sometimes, and. And uh, I've gotten to the habit of downloading things on my phone. I download podcasts and sermons and, and things like that, audio to listen to. And, uh, and as I listened this week, I was downloading sermons from kind of all over the place. I, I went on Google and I, I just put in the passage of Scripture and put the sermons. And it comes up with thousands that people have posted. And it's just a cool resource to, to, to just see what other guys are saying about it. And you get some that are a little kooky that are kind of out on one this way. And you get some that are in the middle. So you've got to kind of weed those out. 
but the majority of the ones that I listened to actually passed over those first eight words. It was in passing. They read the passage, they said the end of all things near, and then they went into therefore, as if everybody just agreed on what that meant. Like everybody just knew what that meant. And it bothered me a little bit, and I also I was tempted to do that because it's a hard thing to explain. It's a hard thing to to to, to wrap our mind around what he meant two thousand years ago when he wrote the end of all things near. But I was convicted that then, if we're going to understand those other verses, we should, we should dig into that. And we shouldn't be afraid of the Word of God. Sometimes we're afraid to look at the passage because they are hard. As preachers, as, as students of the Word, as, 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 as people sitting in, in, in this life, we're afraid of some passages. And uh, I believe the whole Word of God is for us and it blesses us. So we're going to dive into that today. Um, two questions that we have to ask, though, when I approach any passage of Scripture is this. Is that the first thing you have to say is that what does it mean to the people in the context of when it was written? Okay, it, it has to have meant something 2,000 years ago when Peter sat down under the power of the Holy Spirit and wrote this letter to some people about some things that were going on and how you should live your life. It has to mean something to them. And sometimes it means something different for us in the future. The book of 1 Peter was written to a specific time, a specific place, to a specific people. It was written to them specifically, but it was also written for us because we're Christians and God's Word is preserved for us. So we need to keep that in perspective that sometimes the words that we're reading were written to someone else, but they were written for us in the future. And that's the context. That's kind of where I stay. That's where I live when I'm studying the epistles, when these letters that were written. When I first looked at the whole book of First Peter, I said, well, uh, this is kind of awkward because we're not really talking about any time streams in this series. It hasn't really been a theme of what we're going through. We're talking about how we're living our life now. But as I moved more through the book of First Peter, I noticed that in almost every chapter in First Peter, and again in the book of Second Peter, that the, the, the return of Christ, the end times, the last days, were on his mind throughout the whole book. And as I read back through this this week, I read through the whole book several times just kind of just to, to get a grasp on where, we, where we've been and where we're going. You don't have to turn to all these, but in the first, in the first chapter, verse 5, it says, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at this last time, he says. He says in, uh, again in verse 7, it says, That you may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus. In chapter, in chapter 1, verse 13, he says it again. He says, set your hope fully on the grace that will brought, be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Throughout the whole book, and on into chapter 4 and chapter 5, he talks about this concept of the end of things. About the returning of Christ, about Christ being revealed to us in some way. And so as I come to this verse, I, 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 I settled in a little bit. I was more okay with with looking at this because it was on his mind when he wrote this. When Peter wrote this book, he was thinking about Jesus. And he was thinking, he knew that he had come before, he had experienced, he lived life with him. He had died, this is 30 years later, and he knew at that point that someday he was going to come back. That was his perspective when he wrote this book. Little, uh, where this gets difficult sometimes is that this, this is a, a, a passage of Scripture that is, that is argued and thought about, that is, that is, that is disagreed on, that, that, is, that, that tears two things apart. And what I want to encourage us to do, and when we get to hard passages like this, when it says the end of all things is near, our knee-jerk reaction is to separate and to argue about it, but we can love each other, and we can talk about these things, and we can approach these things, because they're in God's Word. He wants us to know. He wants us to know these things. And so this morning, as I approach this, I'd like to just make a suggestion. I would, I would, I would, I'd like to suggest to you what Peter was talking about. And as Peter wrote this letter, he wrote it with, uh, with the, the end in time, and I believe that he was talking about words that Jesus actually said to him. When he was sitting under the teaching of Jesus when he was still alive, there's a passage in Luke 21, and I'd like you to turn there with me. And we're going to spend some time in Luke 21 this morning looking at this passage. This is a passage that is that is not exactly repeated in three of the Gospels. It's in, it's in the book of Luke. It's in uh, Mark chapter 13, I believe, and also a kind of a larger version in Matthew 24. Um, 
Well, Jesus was talking to, uh, to his, his, his apostles, the apostles were his disciples, I mean, his disciples about, about some things, and they, they asked a question to him, and he spends his chapter giving an answer to them about this question. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 21 and verse 5, and he says this. They were just, they're near the temple, they just kind of walked out and said, why some were speaking of the temple and how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings. He said, so, so there's people, the, the, the temple that was, a, that was around there was a beautiful thing. It was built by the Jewish people for God. And they had given their best. It was, it was gold and rubies and all, everything you could ever imagine, the most beautiful things in this world were there. It was the center of the Jewish religion at the time, that everything flocked to there. And it was, it was the center point of everything that, that, that happened in Israel. And they said, look, look at this beautiful thing. This is what Jesus said in response to those people kind of murmuring about how awesome the temple was. He says, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another and, and that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, here's the question they asked, Teacher, when will these things be and what will be the sign when these are about to take place? And he answered them and he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he. The time is at hand. Some people are going to say that. He says, Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. He's saying that the end is coming, these things are going to be fulfilled. And here's some signs that you can tell when those things are going to come. He said, when you hear war, of wars, when you hear of rumors of wars that are going to happen, these tumults that are happening, you know that the end isn't here yet, but it's on its way. The end of these things is on its way. Let's go to verse 10. So it says, Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famine, and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs in heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake, and this will be your opportunity to bear witness. The last couple of weeks, uh, um, Guy and also Luke last week really did a good job of setting in the, in the, the context of what was going on when Peter wrote this book, and, and in response to what is going on in Luke 21, that, he, that, that the people that were, that were reading this book, the first Peter in the first century, were under great persecution. They lived underneath the Roman Empire that had kind of a crazy, this young and crazy and really maniacal emperor, his name was Nero, and was persecuting the, the, the church, not because they were Christians necessarily, but because it was an easy scapegoat. He had set the whole half of Rome on fire, it was burning, and uh, you, you heard the, the saying that, you know, Nero fiddled as Rome burned. Well, that came out of a true event. There was no fiddles then, they weren't invented yet, but the, the uh, interesting what you learn when you're, when you're looking stuff up. Uh, but the fact that he, he, he needed, people were mad at him because he set Rome on fire. And he goes, well, it wasn't me. It was the Christians. And he said, it's their fault. It's just they're kind of crazy and they're kind of weird and they're kind of outcasts. Let's blame it on them. And they were murdered for that because of the lie that he told. And, and they, were, they were tortured and they were put on display. It was an awful time for the people that were living there. That's what they were living under. The people that he wrote to. In the light of this, look what it says. They will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Verse 13 is awesome. It says, but this will be an opportunity for you to bear witness. The whole point of our series in First Peter has been the fact that we should live differently in this world. We should live strange in the world that we live in. He was telling people 30 years before he wrote this, that Peter wrote this letter, he was saying, this is going to get a lot worse. I know you're seeing some awful things right now. It's going to get a lot worse. But it's going to be an opportunity for you to be a witness for me. And as Peter is writing to his people, his disciples, his, his students that are under him, the people that he was in charge of and, and a shepherd over, and he writes to them, he remembers back to what Jesus had said, and he tells his own people that, you know what, it's going to get bad. 
He says it's going to get you. There's probably a footnote on his letter. He wrote the Luke stuff. <laughs> Maybe not. But, uh, but the, the, remember what is going on here. And that it's an opportunity not for you to give up. It's an opportunity not for you to, to run away from the gospel, but to have an opportunity to be a witness to Jesus Christ because of the persecutions and the sufferings that are going to come upon you in the near future. And even from the time that Peter wrote that letter, it did get worse. Go to verse 20 in that same chapter. It says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart, and let those who are out in the country not enter it. For these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all the written. Verse 29 of the same chapter says this. He told them a parable, look at the fig tree and all the, and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see them for yourself and know that the summer is nearly here. So also, when you see these things taking place, you may know the kingdom of God is near. And truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all of this has taken place. That was a hard statement for Jesus to say. That was his whole answer to people that were living in Jerusalem, looking at a temple and commenting how beautiful it is. And yet he made some very specific predictions about how an army would come and it would surround that city and there would be pestilences and diseases and famines that would happen in that place and that every stone would be turned over and it would be laid desolate before them. If Jesus had made all those predictions and that had not happened, what kind of prophet would he have been? Could he claim to be the son of God at that point when he made those predictions and none of those things took place? Those were hard things at that time. Sometimes they're hard for us to understand right now. But Jesus made some specific things that were about to happen when Peter wrote that letter. Peter wrote his letter in the early part of the 60s AD, in, 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 under the reign of Nero. Soon after that, Nero took his own life. He was crazy. He had killed everybody he loved. He was paranoid. He took his own life. His general, uh, Vespasian was his name, took over. And he was more evil than Nero. And it kept getting worse and worse until right around 70 AD, the, the temple was still standing. These wars had been happen, happening. The, the Roman armies had come from the north and had come down and had met Jerusalem. They were locked inside. And in 70 AD, Titus, the guy that had taken, that had took it in a succession of efforts, took over and crushed that city. They broke down the walls. And as it happens, every stone was turned over. The place was burned down and left desolate. They killed people. They persecuted people. So it, was, it was an awful day in history in general, but also later for the, for the city of, of Jerusalem, for the people that lived there. For the Christians that lived there, they were a part of it, they had to witness that. The Jewish Christians that were there, that had grown up in that temple and looking at to see that the judgment of God was coming on a people and a place that was so dear to them. That was hard for them to understand. The end was near in Jesus' time when he said these things to the to his apostles, to his disciples. It was near. It was more near when Peter wrote his book. When Peter wrote First Peter at the end of it was in the middle of the 60s AD, it was way more near than that. And those things were going to come, and they did come, and all those things. And, but listen to this. Go and turn to Hebrews, chapter eight. What was ending was an epic and an era at the time. The people up until that time had been living under, under the old covenant, under under the law of, of Israel, under this temple sacrifice system that was that, that, that had been going on for centuries. They were living under that. Um, they, they were living under this this kind of oppression of the Jewish leadership at the time, especially as Christians. They were being persecuted by Rome, but a lot of that was coming directly from the Jewish leadership. We read in Acts when people were martyred. Most of the time, the stories you hear, it's not Romans that came. It was the Jewish leadership. It was guys like Saul that was, that was there, and, and it says that he witnessed the, 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 the martyrdom of Stephen and approved it and gave approval to the Christians dying because they were, they were heretics and they were, they were uh, blasphemers. 
they were living under the sea. That was going to be old covenant of things. And look at it in, in Hebrews chapter 8. I want to read this passage to you. I'm going to read the whole passage first. But I, want to, I, want, I want you to think about what he's talking about here. He's quoting the Old Testament. The writer of Hebrews is quoting the Old Testament, talking about the time that Peter was living in. It was a, pro- a prophetic time talking about this time when Jesus would bring a new covenant to his people. And he says, For Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern to them, declares the Lord. He's talking about, remember what happened when with Moses? And how he received the law, and all those things started there, and God made a covenant with the nation of Israel. And he said, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That new covenant came in when Jesus came. He brought it with him. He brought it to the cross, and when he died for our sins on that cross and he rose again on the third day, that new covenant started. Not an old covenant of sacrifices of animals that didn't last, that we had to return to the temple every year and sacrifice more animals and more blood had to be shed. But for one time in all of history, Jesus came with this new covenant to forgive us of our sins. That blood was shed with the perfect plan of God. That he, that he died on that cross for us at Black Hill. And in the time of, of Jesus was, 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 was speaking to his disciples, and, and up until the time when, when, when uh, Peter wrote this book of the transition period, it's a weird time. Because you can imagine people saying, well, I thought Christ took care of that, but I can look at this temple, and there's still ushering in animals, and there's sacrificing things, and all these things are still going on. What's the thing? What's the deal? And the writer of Hebrews addresses that in his last verse. He says this, and speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. This is a transitional period in the time of the Jewish nation, in the time of Christians, where the old covenant was on its way out, and yet the new covenant, the, the Christians, the followers of Christ, were coming in with, with an awesome force that God had. The book of Hebrews was written about the same time as Peter was writing this book. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. When I look at uh, um, theology, and when I look at uh, the Bible, when I'm interpreting the Bible, and we all do, we all look at it and say, what does this mean? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a theological term that, that helps me when I look at passages that are already understood. And, and some people take it a different way. This is how I take it. But um, it's called already but not yet, is how I describe what I believe and how I interpret passages like this. And let me give you a couple examples outside of end time, and then I want to apply it to that. When you look at the kingdom of God, there's passage after passage that Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your presence, that you are a member of the kingdom of God, that you are no longer citizens of this world, that you are citizens of a kingdom, that you were once were far away, but you've been brought near to the kingdom of God, and Jesus is our king. We live in that right now. You guys know that you guys are citizens of a kingdom that is so much more than anything we have here? But in saying that, I don't say that someday Jesus is going to come back and he's, it's going to be an eternal kingdom that we are going to live with him in eternity in a perfect world. By me saying that we have a kingdom now already, I do not negate the fact that Jesus is coming back and there's going to be a kingdom that I'm going to be his servant in for the rest of eternity. The same thing with our salvation. I'm saved right now. I hope you guys are. You've received salvation. You've been called and you've been, you've been, you've been justified. There's a passage in Romans, Romans chapter 8. Actually, let's turn there real quick. A couple more minutes here. Second service had off and early. You guys stay all day. <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, Romans chapter 8 says this. Verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. 
He said, for those who he foreknew, he also predestined to, to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And listen to this, he says, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. That justification is our salvation. When I believe in Jesus, he takes away my sins. I've been justified before God. But he doesn't end there. He said, you're already justified. But he says, and those who he justified, he also glorified. By me saying that I have received salvation today when I talk to you this morning does not negate the fact that someday I'm going to receive the rest of that salvation in God's glory. My salvation is going to be carried out in a real way. It's in a very practical way now. My sins are forgiven. But someday, as a believer, someone who has been called and justified, the promise is that I will be glorified in that way. I apply that same theory when we talk about the end is near. By saying that some things have happened in the, in the end, that when, when Peter said the end is near, and he was talking about a whole lot of things, he was talking about some specific things that were about to happen within three to five years of when he wrote that. All those things were done. The temple was on the ground and it was completely destroyed. In 70 AD, the, the, the Roman armies captured the city and flattened it completely. The fact that all those things are, are already done, or already happened, does not make the fact that someday we will see it come back. And so as Peter wrote this book about the end is being near, the end is at hand, so many years ago, this morning, if I was going to write a letter to this congregation, I could begin that letter with, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, live your life like you live it I believe that Christ will come back at any day, and we're going to look at it. If we really believe that, how we should love our lives. So turn back to First Peter. As we set this foundation for these next few verses now, we're coming to the end of this, and I want to talk to you about, in light of all those things that he said, the end being here, this is the way you should live your life. In First Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7, it says this. And I'll read that again. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. The way, if you've seen how people get excited when someone says the end is near, I get excited about it. I enjoy talking about it. But we've had some really crazy people in our recent time. Remember a few years ago, where, when you, if you saw the billboards up, when people were, were selling all their things, passing out their retirement accounts and buying billboards saying the end is near and that Jesus is going to come and it's going to end the world and all these things. And they sat there and they waited. In Jesus' time, the same thing was going on. I mean, in Peter's time after Jesus, there was a group of people that believed that Jesus was going to come back right there, and they sat there. And the apostle said, if you don't work, you don't eat. We're not taking care of you. I know we're supposed to love people take care of people, but you're crazy. Get up, get, get up and occupy until he comes back. Work harder now knowing that he's going to come back than you did before. And sometimes when we look at, we look at passages we, or experiences in our lives, we say, well, you know, God, God's going to take those experiences away from you. Fine. I pray for those things. I pray for God to protect me. Protect me from temptation in this world. But you know what? So many times if you read through the letters that the apostle wrote, it says, it's like a be self-control and sober mind. Take a little bit of responsibility for yourself in the fact that you really believe what is going on is going on. To live like you mean it. Be self-control. Yeah, God's going to give you the power through His Spirit to live that way. But some of that falls on you. Be sober-minded. Don't be, a, don't be maniacal and crazy about things. Be sober-minded. Look at the truth and live like you believe it. And it also says for the sake of your prayers, the way that we live our lives affects the way that we communicate with God. The way that I live my life today is going to affect the effectiveness of my prayers, how much I can really communicate with God. I don't know all the connections there and how that works. I know that over and over that the, the, the Scripture says the way that you're living your life, the righteous way you're living your life affects your relationship with Almighty God. And so many of us. Verse 8. Above all these things, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. As Alicia pointed out earlier, you guys probably heard a lot about love this week and this month. And it comes out in so many different ways. And as Alicia said, your loved ones a long time ago. 
But when I look at this passage, we have to look at it in what love the passage is. We have to look at what this passage is not saying to us. And what, what this passage is not saying, that love covers the multitude of sins, but it takes those sins and calls them not sin. It doesn't say that there. You can't, you can't make that say that in Hebrew. The fact that it says, it says that if God has called something sin, it is sin today, and it always has been, and it always will be. What it doesn't say is that we just don't talk about those sins. It doesn't say that there's sins in this world that are difficult and that, that we offend people by talking about those sins. So we're just going to sweep them under a rug, and that's what I mean, to cover them up so we know how to, we don't have to look at them. They're still sins. We agree with God, but we're not going to talk about them, and we're not going to deal with them. It doesn't say that either. This morning, as I, as I go through my notes, I, I thought of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it's this love chapter. What, it says what love does. It says love is patient, and love is kind, and love is long-suffering, and all these things. And at the end of that passage, it says that love rejoices in all truth. Without the truth of God, without the truth of His Word, we can't truly love people. Love one another, because that love covers up some of the things that the forgiveness, the grace that we give to people. Verse 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And this time there were people, you remember the first couple verses in chapter, in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, since so those were in the dispersion that were cast out everywhere. That was an important thing for them to be hospitable, to bring people to the door for these Christians to stay. But today in our, in our world, there are people that are lost and wandering, and we need to be hospitable to them. Even when they're, even when they're ugly, even when they're dirty, even when they're not lovable, even when everybody else has decided not to be hospitable to those people. Those are the people that need that hospitality, that love, and grace. We're called to that. It doesn't say you feel like it. I'm sorry. Or if it, it's convenient. It says be hospitable with them. Look at the last phrase. This is the hardest part, actually. It says without grumbling. Man, I'm glad they're gone. Or, or, or when are they going to leave? We do it good because we love Jesus and what he's done for us. In light of in light of the end is near, the light of he's coming back, the light of everything that he's already done for you, man, love some people. Bring them into your house, even though you would never like that person in your house. Even though it's scary. I'm not saying you should go find a bum on the street and bring them into your house and put your family in danger. However that works out in your life, some people may be called to that. Whatever it is. Love people. Show hospitality to people. Don't avoid people because they're unlovable, because those people are the people that need to love the most. Ten and eleven says this: It says, "As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God, and whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that every in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ." In Romans chapter twelve, Paul talks about the the, the body of Christ, the church as being this body. And then that it's head of Christ, and that it needs all these different spiritual gifts of the different body parts. What he's saying in this passage, and you can look that up in Romans chapter 12 later on, maybe in your life group. But uh, the fact that, that, that God gave gifts, if you're saved, you received the Holy Spirit in your life, God has given you a gift. And not to build you up, not to, not to make you awesome, but to build up his church, to build up the body of Christ, to serve the body of Christ. God, and it says, be good stewards of his very grace, because those gifts are all different. Every one of those gifts, some of us have gifts of, of speaking, it says in there. It says, if you're speaking to God, do it as if it was really God speaking. That's really the oracles of God speaking. So speak for God if you really believe what you're saying, the words coming out of your mouth. That you weren't, you weren't just going through the motions because that's what God told you to do, but that you actually believe it with the words of God you were speaking. And if you're called to serve, if you're given a gift of service, do it with the power of God. Don't do it under your own strength. You're gonna, you're gonna fail. You're gonna give up. The weight is gonna be so heavy on you trying to serve people in this world without the power of God. He says, do it because God is behind you. God has given you the gift and the strength to go into this world and do it. The main reason we should live our lives this way is how He ends this section. In order that, in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The way that I live my life, 
is not to obtain anything. Not to impress all of you out there. Not to not to make my life easier and, and, and to do things right and live rightly because that, but it is to give glory to God with every single thing that I do. When I live a righteous life because I've been called to do it, yeah, my life's probably going to be better. There's certain things I'm going to avoid in my life, like you know, jail and, and things like that. But the ultimate goal is that God looks down on my life, looks down at your life, and says, that person and their life will be a blessing to God. And to be a blessing to God and to, and to give God glory through your life. Because the whole point of all this is the strength of things that we're talking about in the message. To give the glory to God. And he ends with this, it's doxology. He says this, and I'll end with it as well this morning. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for uh, this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, just the opportunity to serve you with our lives. God, I thank you for uh, your church, the gifts that you've given. God, the opportunity to serve each of us. To love one another. God, I pray that as, as we leave here today in life, that, that uh, we're not guaranteed another day on this earth. We just live our lives as God has given them to each other. Because today may be our last. And we need to serve you with everything that we